Very good evening and a warm welcome to General Theory of Relativity lecture number three, where we are actually dealing with something which is called geodesics of particle. That means how actually things move around in uh, space time. Uh, I have already made one video on the geodesics of particle and Newton's second law of motion, how each of them are related to each other. However, in this video, uh, I would like to explore a little bit more. The reason was that the first, the earlier lecture actually uh, sometimes ended abruptly. So uh, the agenda of today's lecture would be to know about what is a geodesic, uh, what are the components of the geodesic, how geodesic is related to movement along uh, the space time, and also uh, how a geodesic of a particle is related to Newton's second law of motion. Now, the thing is that why I am taking Newton's second law suddenly uh, in order to explain something very modern, I'm, I won't say modern, something very relativistic is to just let you know that in the previous two video lectures, I have proved that general theory of relativity is basically a classical system. So the question is that if it is a classical system, then definitely it will follow the rules of the classical mechanics. And that is the reason that I want to show that how it follows the rules of the classical mechanics so that you can understand how general relativity evolves from classical mechanics and how both of them, uh, you know, synergize and meet each other in uh, beautifully. So let us go ahead with today's lecture. This was an introduction. So this is something which I want to show you. This is just from the previous lecture. Uh, what we have actually seen is this one that we know now that what is a classical theory. We also know what is a quantum theory. And we know that general relativity is basically a field theory. So the value of any field at any space, uh, any point in space uh, and time can be uniquely determined uh, from, the fields, from the field equation. And what is that field equation? Obviously, Einstein's field equation, the deterministic field equation. So on the right hand side, given any kind of a space where you have got a spinner, we have got a gravitational potential, you have got a electricity, you have got a magnetism, all this actually comprises of what is called a field. Uh, the right, the, on the right hand side, the lower position, actually this part actually tells that if, I, if you are given a kind of an initial condition, making a mass or an energy or something like that, you can we can rather evolve uh, and find out the future behavior of the system. That means given any kind of an initial position, a system should evolve and predict the future. And that is the basic nature of a classical system. Remember, that is a time reversible system. That means from that you can go back to the past. But in case of a spontaneous emission or things which quantum mechanics try to involve, they are not something which can be defined by classical system. So. If the initial conditions can be predicted using deterministic equation like Einstein's field equation, so you might have a question, then uh, definitely general relativity also would have some kind of an initial condition. What are those initial conditions that are given and based on that, the system evolves? That is basically the quest for today's video. So here are there are two very fundamental questions. Question number one is that if general relativity is a classical theory, does it obey the classical laws? Point number one. Is there any relevance of the classical Newton's law with the laws of general relativity? And can we derive equations of motion from the classical laws or vice versa? We can go back or we come back. So these are the very pertinent questions which arises when we know that General relativity is a classical theory and from there, how do we go and how do we evolve into things? So we will start with Newton's laws of motion and we will try to see now how the initial conditions, etc. given together, we can actually, you know, uh, kind of a, a derive Newton's laws of motion so that uh, I would say it will be easy for us to understand. And from there, we will move into what is called geodesic. So uh, let us remember one thing that uh, geodesic is something which is related to movements and Newton's second law of motion is also related to movement. So first we go to this slide and uh, sorry. Yeah. So from here, what we find, first of all, the first slide that we see is that if you take a position function that start with a function that describe the position of an object at a function of a time and let us denote this by X of T simple. 
and it represents the position of the object at time t simple. Now, if we take, okay, yeah, Rakesh, very good evening. Yeah, so I hope you can enjoy this uh, lecture of today. I think this will be very elementary, but something very deep. Thank you. So Rakesh has already wished me good evening. So if I take the first derivative of the position, let us take the first derivative of the position with respect to time, then obviously we know that velocity will be change in the position divided by change in time. So this is the first derivative which I am taking. Now, what I am trying to do is that uh, Goat is asking greatest of all times. Can you tell why curvature is essential to <laughs> general relativity? It is a very simple question because without curvature, the main earth or the entire manifold of the physics is all about curvature. So uh, I think that without curvature, there is nothing. Uh, uh, the earth is not flat. We do not follow a Cartesian space. So simple. That is why we need a curvature. Through experiments and through findings, we have found that everything which moves around uh, uh, space and time is all a curvature. So that is why essential. It is very important to understand curvature. So you need to first understand Cartesian geometry, and then we can move into curvature. I think uh, GOAT, you asked me the same question in one of my videos that why uh, you need to have an understanding of Cartesian geometry yeah, because it is the basics. Without understanding Cartesian geometry, how can we expect to move into curvature and then differential geometry? So uh, it is essential to GR because the entire essence of GR is on a curved space time and we have moved out from the uh, old uh, notion of flat space time to curved space time. I hope that answers your question. So second derivative of position to find the uh, acceleration, we take a second derivative. So what I'm doing is that I'm taking the velocity, which is a change in position divided by change in time, and I'm putting over there. So d by dt becomes the uh, dx by dt, and we know that v equals to dx by dt. Now from here, if we go to this equation, this is very central. So using the chain rule, which I have not, not mentioned, you all know what is the chain rule of calculus. It would be foolish again to repeat. I've although mentioned that it is a derivative of an outer function times the derivative of in, in inner function. So if I apply the chain rule on dx by dt, then I get the acceleration as d by dt and dx by dt. That is the change which, which I just showed you in this slide. Now, substituting this value into this, what we get is this one. Uh, I'm so sorry. It is called d square x by dt square. Okay. Let me now share a little bit of this screen so that I can explain uh, things further. Uh, yeah, where is the screen? Yeah. So I will just, uh, you know, share the Jamboard. Okay. So, no, sorry, it's not required. I'll come to that later. Okay. So uh, what I'm trying to tell over here is that, just a second. Yeah. So what I'm trying to tell over here is that if I take this particular value and what we get is very important. <coughs> Uh, is the second differ order differential for acceleration gives us a parabola that indicates a curvature. I heard it from Amal Ramkumar Raichaudhary. No, I, I, I'm so sorry, uh, Goat. I think, uh, don't take me wrong, but this is something I think you're confusing one with the other. Roy Choudhury, Amal uh, Kumar Roy Choudhury, Roy Choudhury equation is something different which relates with singularity and something else. Second order differential for, uh, equation for acceleration uh, yeah, it generates a kind of a parabola, but that that is not a curvature in terms of, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, general relativity. That is just a parabola. And that is how the particle flows. But uh, Roy Chod Amal Kumar Roy Chodhri, Roy Chodhri equation, if you're talking of Roy Chodhri equation, that is absolutely different. We are not talking of Roy Chodhri equation. Second order differential equation, if the particle accelerates, then it follows a parabola. That is a kind of a curve, but that has nothing to do with the curvature that we are talking about. We are talking about the entire space-time curvature. You are talking about the, uh, you know, curvature of a particular particle. No, sir. Professor Onkoji said, uh, basis on the Einstein equivalence principle. Yeah, that is what I am saying. So if it is Einstein's equivalence principle, you are talking of a particular particle. Yeah, obviously it will generate and then it would create a kind of a parabola. I think you can just hold on goat so that I can... Uh, finish off what I'm trying to express, things will be much clearer to you. Thank you very much for your question. So here you see <coughs> what I get is A equals to D square X and DT square. Now let us keep this in mind. This is a very important equation. 
So it shows that the second derivative of the position function with respect to time gives us the acceleration. Let us keep it in mind. The second derivative of the position function with respect to time gives the acceleration. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Goat has uh, rightly told that the acceleration of a particular particle, if it moves, it creates a kind of a parabola. Okay, fine. Is te you are telling that you are not thought of Rajab regression. Then, then it's fine. Okay. So what we can tell that in summary, by differentiating the position function with respect to time, we arrive at this equation A equals to d square x by dt square. Okay. So you can keep a note of this. Now, this is important. I am taking a pause from this. Now I am moving to general relativity because I would like to show you something very important. First, I would like to quickly explain you what is a geodesic. You can just go through it. Nothing that you need to men, uh, remember. So it is basically, you need to understand that it is basically a straight line, the shortest path between us, between, uh, you know, between two points. So now what I will do, say, for example, if I share my, uh, this screen, uh, just a second, yeah, I will share this, this part. Okay. So what happens if I, if you see here, if I, if I take a kind of a, any kind of a curved path, if I can, any kind of a space over here anything i mean to say random and what i can do is that if i take any any point over here and any point over here anything it can be curved on anything there's the shortest point between these two this is what is called a geodesic okay so the shortest point that will move from one point to other now if i take a kind of a flat space say for example if i take a euclidean space like this okay i take an euclidean space like this and if i take say for example two two points Simple, flat space. So that would be a straight line. Now, here you see, I have uh, mentioned that this is a generalization. So from here, sorry, from here, we go to here. Now, why it is? Because whenever we are, as Goat was telling that we have got a curved space. Now, the moment we are getting a curved space, we do cannot have a straight line. Obviously, it will become a kind of a curvature. And this curvature of between two points is nothing but the generalization of the straight line. Because straight line won't be uh, straight, it will become a curved. So that is what is called a geodesic. Let us go back. Things will become much more clearer. Okay. Let me stop the screen sharing of this part and let me enter here. Okay. So here you see, so it is geodesy actually comes from the uh, Latin word, uh, sorry, the Greek word geodesia, which means division of. That means right from uh, early Greek uh, times, we know that geodesy has something to deal with. Uh, the measurement of earth so, so so you see it is called the science of measuring the size and shape of earth and it is the shortest route between two points on earth's surface now here it is something very very important right at the bottom what i have written in general geodesics are not the same as shortest curves between points though the concept two concepts are closely related between each other the difference are is that geodesics are only locally the shortest distance between points and are parameterized with constant speed. This is important. Now, let me share my screen once more because I want to show you this is this is a wrong concept which most of the students nowadays they have. So I really don't want you to have this wrong concept. So mention, uh, I, I will just like to show you something. Okay. So if I get a kind of a, say for example, this is a kind of a surface. Okay. So if this is a surface, say for example, okay, and here is a person, sorry for my horrible drawing, okay, here is a person who is standing outside somewhere, outside somewhere, and what happens if these are the different points in the surface, then the straight line, what happens if I take a kind of a straight line, it moves from here to here, here to here, here to here, and then it goes back and comes down and goes back. So these are all points. Now, the person who is standing here, I mean to say, for example, this person, this person is watching what? This person is observing that this is a global in nature. This is something which is very global. So for this person, you might see that these actual, actually these points, these are might not be straight lines or shortest distance. It might be something else. But so for example, the person is standing outside. Now, say, for example, if I take another surface, I take another surface. And what I will do is that I will make another person stand here, but this person is standing locally. Okay. 
this person is standing locally, not outside the circle. Now you, you see, if I make these points, sorry, uh, just a second. If I make these points happen, say for example, from this point to this point, then again from this point to this point, then again from this point to this point, and again this point, and then this point. Now what this person is going to see, this person is going to see that these are the shortest distance between two points. So if, if it is A, it is going to the shortest distance B. That means this person will see things locally. I have in many occasions tried to point out this difference. This is topology. This is topology. Okay. And this is DG. That is differential geometry. I've tried to point out this in many occasions that the difference between topology and differential geometry is that topology is much more on a global scale. That means this person are, is not finding this to be a straight line, whereas this person, because it is local, it is finding in the straight line. Remember that geodesics are only meant locally. That means if I take a geodesic over here, if I mention this to be a geodesic, if this is to be a geodesic, then definitely what I have to do is that I have to frame a kind of a surface where these lines, these lines, all those lines should be local, should be local. And that is only when geodesics come into being. If the person is standing outward and we are trying to make something with topology like neighborhood of a point and all those things, uh, you know, balls, etc., then uh, it won't be uh, it won't be local. It would be global. So this should be important. This person standing here is watching this topologically globally. It is not a geodesic, but a person is locally. It is called geodesic, and that is why we have got a term. We have got a term which is called differentiable manifold. I will come to this later when we will take up further details into manifold structure, but try to understand what is a differential manifold and why it is very important in terms of uh, general relativity, especially over here. The reason is that if I take any kind of a structure over here, right, and if I subdivide those structure very, uh, you know, minutely, I mean to say I am performing what is called a differentiation on each of this surface and I can I can just use the dy by dx that means I'm using the rules of calculus if I'm using the rules of calculus then this is called a geo differentiable manifold I will show you also how geodesics actually occur in differential man man manifold that means if it is a differentiable manifold then only I can say this to be a geodesic to be a geodesic, to be a geodesic. That means if and only if I can differentiate this by using the rules of calculus, then only it will be, if I can apply calculus, then only it should be a geodesic because I can apply calculus in a differentiable manifold where things are differentiated and it is local and that is why it is a geodesic. This is a very subtle difference which people do not understand, but I just wanted to make you understand that why I have used this term. Now, let me remove this. You will understand this part of the uh, slide that I have used that shortest distance between points and are parameterized with constant speed. There's something called a constant speed in professional but I'm not going. But this is why I have drawn an arrow, which is called a differentiable manifold. That means geodesic will only occur when we can apply the rules of calculus and further take the manifold, differentiate it just like I have shown, and that is how it becomes easy. So only and only when I can get this kind of a stuff, only and when I can get this kind of a stuff, which is very local, then only geodesics happen. In global structure, geodesic is not going to happen. So here it is. It is geodesic, which is local. We can call it a geodesic. And only and only when we can use, we can differentiate the manifold into further structure using calculus, then only it becomes a differentiable. That means you can say, now, sir, is it that the geodesics rule can be applied on a differentiable manifold? Absolutely, yes. But I will take up later because that would lead into further mathematical complications. Okay, now we go back what we where we have started. Now, what do you see? We understood what is a geodesic. Okay, here is a simple example. So the great circle around the globe is a geodesic. Shortest line between two paths is a geodesic. So overall, what we can say is that a geodesic is the shortest path between two points on a curved space. It is often described the curve as that locally minimizes the distance. That means something which 
is very short. Now, I have not shown even in triangle, you can have geodesics on a, a triangulation, etc. I have, I have just skipped those parts because my objective first is to make you understand that how geodesics are related to Newton's laws of motion. Okay, so these are, uh, again, I'm skipping. So anything will be a geodesic, etc. Okay, so here is a quick example. So in a straight line, geodesics notion of a straight line. So the ball will roll in a straight line because there is no force. And here on the right hand side, you see the ball will roll down the hill because the curve of the curvature of the space time. Now, this is something you will see automatically you are getting hold of what is the central idea of geodesics. Uh, is geodesic a constrained motion? A uh, very good question, Vishal. Um, <coughs> I won't say it is a sorry, I won't say it is a constrained motion, Vishal. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. It is not a constrained motion, Vishal. I will say constrained motion is something when which is physically trying to constrain. It's a very good question. I should, should congratulate you. But Vishal, the thing is that as I will show you, the geodesic is actually come, coming from the Lagrangian. That is the nature's automatic way of taking the least path action. So if I leave a particle, if I leave the particle on a curved space time, with no external influences, the path that it will follow is a geodesic, right? So here, say for example, I'm so sorry, I'm getting confused between slides. So here, as you can see, uh, in this part, okay, let me just, uh, I, I think I should answer answers Vishal's question. This is uh, very, very, very central. Okay, so uh, Vishal, if I take this kind of a path, okay, where things are, say for example, it's a straight line, it's a body which is around here. Okay, this this body. Now, what I can tell you is that if it would have been a constrained motion, that means it is trying to move, we are trying to rest it. But in a kind of a, say for example, a curved space like this, and the ball is around here. Okay, no, no, intern, uh, no influences, no external influence, then by the nature of this, the geodesic, which is a straight line for the, the ball will start following here, this path. Okay, so literally term what geodesic means. Ah, yes, Rakesh has got the right point. A free fall geodesic and a geodesic is a constraint. Yeah, in either way we can tell that. But but the thing is that constraint means some external force Vishal is trying to control that. I say I am constraining myself. Here, the particle is free, as Rakesh has pointed out. Particle is free. It is following the Lagrangian. I will slow, I will show you. And it is following the least path action, path action right? But you have made a very good point. Uh, I mean to say, you can confuse people with that uh, constraint motion. But yes, that is how. So what what Rakesh is telling is, yeah. So okay. So let me go back. Otherwise, uh, I will be late and unable to cover up this part, which is important. So if the ball now here, you see at the bottom what I have written: the curvature of space time is what causes particle to accelerate in the absence of any external force. The only force acting on a particle is a gravitational force caused by the curvature of space-time. Right? Caused by the curvature of space-time. Uh, what is Bisha? But here is here normal is a force of an example. When we penetrate and go straight, we follow geodesic. There is a constraint by the path. Yeah, absolutely. You are very right. Yeah, that is true. So, very true. I, I agree to Vishal's, uh, Vishal's point. That is true when we go through it. So what I'm trying to make a point to all of you is that the uh, what is happening, the only force acting on a particle is the gravitational force caused by the curvature of space time. Gravitational force is not there. Try to understand. The notion of force we have eliminated with Isaac Newton. So we are saying that the gravitational force caused by the curvature of space time is the manifestation of space time. That means the geodesic is following the straight path. Either it is curved, etc. It is a straight line. But it is the curvature on a free particle. It is allowing the body to move like that. I hope that makes it clear. Okay. Now what I will do is that, okay, I'm skipping this part. You already know that the normal Cartesian rules, Pythagoras' theorem, etc. won't work out. Uh, for a curvature, we need something which is called a, a computation of length. We need tensors, etc. Now I come to the very central part of our video, which is called what is a geodesic? Okay. First of all, okay, before I go to the slide, I would like to show you something very interesting over here. Okay, now you see, 
um, let me go back. Okay. Now, first of all, you need to see the geodesic equation looks a little bit monstrous. Okay. I'm not removing this. It will take time. This is what the geodesic equation looks like. Okay. If you want, I can remove this part. Okay. That makes it clear. Now, this is the geodesic equation. I will just explain you line by line each of the component because it would become so interesting. I fell in love. You know, I, I, I found that physics indeed is so beautiful. People say that what is the beauty of mathematics, beauty of physics. I have started to realizing, although I have started to realize much earlier, but now things are becoming more beautiful. Now, what do you see? I will explain all of this. Don't worry. First of all, you take a notice of this S. This is what is called the proper time. Okay, you know all proper time, so I don't need to explain. Now, remember, in some of the literature of general theory of relativity, Wikipedia, etc., this S gets replaced by this tau. Tau means proper time because it is for T. Some people use as tau. So what is going to happen? Remember, all these S, these are proper time, just as the time of Isaac Newton. This one, this one, and this one. So eventually what is going to happen is that this equation will become this equation if I replace it by tau square. Clear? I just wanted to show you because otherwise you might say that, okay, what is happening? How come the tau is coming, etc. So this is what uh, it is all about. This gets reduced to this. Okay. Now let me go back uh, to this part. So the geodesic equation is something which is, I have already, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Geodesic equation looks like this. So what does the geodesic equation tells or overall? It tells that the paths of that free falling particles followed in curved space time. These paths are the equivalent of straight lines in curved space. So Vishal, I hope now you can understand why I was telling and Rakesh was also already telling that it is kind of a free fall of particles. That means things. But also the second point that you have told is also right. So I have shown here that all this S might be replaced by tau. So don't worry if you see tau, that is means what? This is a proper time. Okay. Now I go, to go back to this. I will explain you component by component. Now first you see this d square x mu and d s square. Okay. See the, 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 this d square x mu and d uh, this one. So what, what is happening over here is that you see that uh, mu, you already understand those who have attended my earlier, uh, you know, videos and lecture. Again, Saturday, I'm coming up with something. This generativity in a different dimension, you can also join, write me a mail. So what is the X mu? Actually, mu means dimension. For Einstein field equation, it is all dimension, 1, 2, 3, 4. So what is happening? This term is representing X mu with respect to proper time, that is S or tau, for example, which is the time measured by a clock moving around the particle. Now, those who are very keen observer, I mean to say those who are uh, watching this video, I think you have already understood that there is a similarity where what is coming up between Newton's laws of motions and uh, geodesics. Can you see? There also we saw a second derivative. Here also we see our second derivative. There also we saw a t. Here also we saw a time. So that is what the beauty of classical mechanics that you can very easily shift from one place to another. So the first component is clear d square x mu by ds square which is actually expecting, uh, showing the uh, second derivative with respect to the proper time s. Okay. Now, let us come to the second term. There is a minus sign. I will explain those things. This is uh, gamma mu alpha beta. Okay. Now, this is called the Christopher limit. Uh, sorry, Christopher symbol of the second limit. Okay. Let me tell you. So, actually, this was invented by the German mathematician who made a lot of contributions to differential ge geometry, Elvin Bruno Christoffel. So, there are actually two types of Christoffel symbols. Okay, let me take a pause and make you understand. Uh, this will come eventually, but whenever, remember, we are uh, reading or learning general theory of relativity, there is one central component which is called the metric tensor. I repeat, it is metric tensor. I've got a very detailed video. Uh, you can go back to my playlist and check how metric tensor is all about. It's a kind of a measurement. So I'm going from here to my college, from my college to Minnesota, from here to there. All are being measured. Kilogram, liter, all, etc. So the metric tensor is also a kind of a measurement. Now, this Christopher symbol can be expressed in two ways. One is that it is expressed in metric. Now, you say, why is it metric? Because metric is the central area component of uh, Einstein field equation so that we can understand the curvature, how bad we are standing, etc. Very central. 
and it can also be you know uh, represented in terms of the covariant derivative now here you might ask me a question what is a covariant derivative now see covariant derivative itself is a very big chapter i will make a separate class on that but ordinary derivatives dy dx d square these that etc ordinary derivatives fail to perform in a curved space time so you see goat was asking that why do we measure the curvature of space time so goat you got the answer curvature at some space uh, places are so significant that ordinary derivatives are also facing now just like straight line are extended to geodesic uh, ordinary derivatives are also extended to covariant derivatives these are all extension nothing is wrong don't say that derivatives does not occur everything happens but it is a kind of a um, uh, you know <coughs> kind of a extension okay which is why curvature of space time creates attraction and why not repulsion uh, this is uh, again um, uh, you know uh, it creates an attraction uh, i need to tell you vishal uh, again because the gravitational potential that is being measured okay this will again come in today's video just watch it so whatever we are measuring is basically the lagrangian and the curvature of space time is basically causing due to the gradient so you will see the equation actually talks of the gradient so gradient is what or obviously it is an attraction not a repulsion so gravity itself because it, i mean to say gravity of einstein i mean to say gravitational uh, space time the, the gravity that we are talking about is actually caused by the is defined by the uh, uh, lagrangian of the uh, what we call uh, this one the slope that that is a slope that is that is what we call the uh, you know nabla sign partial derivative y so that is basically the slope the gradient so gravity is automatically caused by gradient so we cannot have a repulsion so these will come and once the equations are clear any anyway what i was telling is that covariant derivatives are basically extension of the natural derivatives which actually doesn't happen in curved space time so christoffel symbols are defined in two ways one is that with the metric now you ask me why metric metric is required otherwise angle line straight lines distances nothing would be measured in terms of metric tensor one second is that christopher symbols of the second kind are measured in terms of the covariant derivative why covariant derivative we have to take a derivative as i told you just now as i told you just now you see this uh, slide this one i'm so sorry uh, where it is this one yeah it is a differentiable manifold so we have to take a kind of a calculus and this calculus this differential manifold will this dy by dx will not take place this is not going to happen at all what is going to happen the covariant derivative we will come to that later so i just wanted to mention you that when we are talking about this part then why it is called first and second so first is already defined in terms of metric tensor and the second is called the covariant now so here we we just you see this one it is called the christoffel symbols of the second kind because of this reason in the middle the reason is written that the christoffel symbols of the second and called second kind because they are defined in terms of the covariant derivative which is a second order differential operator second kind second kind, second order differential operator but these differential operators are not the usual calculus wala differential operator is definitely a calculus but it is an extension of the normal derivative which is called the covariant derivative so we understood this now you see this is this is i'm so sorry this has got a you know up and down in the font size anyway so what it tells that they are related to the curvature of space time and they encapsulate the effects of gravity so an entire geodesic equation actually is a capsule where all the areas of gravity are there and the christoffel symbol measures the curvature of space time so the larger is the curvature christoffel symbols will be more lesser it will be less that is why we get a zero christoffel symbol in a flat space time clear okay now you see i try to explain so this mu is the index in v of the coordinate which the quad, quad, uh, sorry covariant derivative is taken so based on the we have to take a covariant derivative based on index right we cannot take just like that so this mu is basically the index on which the covariant derivative is taken alpha and beta these are different coordinates okay now here i will sh show you a wonderful beauty of nature the beauty of mathematics you see christoffel symbols are symmetric in their lower indices 
Okay, anyway, Vishal and Goat, whoever, uh, Rakesh, who are there, can you tell me what is the meaning of crystal symbols are symmetric in their lower indices? Does it become very important? What are those? I will wait for your answer. If you want, you can put it in the chat box. Otherwise, I will keep on explaining. So whenever we say that something is symmetric, what is going to happen is that this symmetry is basically the symmetry of mathematics, symmetry of physics, symmetry of Noetius theorem, and it will eventually follow the rules of symmetry. So what is happening over here, you see, that these has got many important implications. and I'm going to show you those implications today. So bear with me. But remember, Christopher symbols at the lower indices are actually symmetric in nature. Now we go to the last part. That is the remaining one, dx mu. And then we see ds. So you see here, the term represents the first derivative of the coordinate. Now try to recall, we also had a first derivative in Newton's second law, right? with respect to proper time s, which indicates the velocity. Again, x beta is what? It, this represents the first derivative of the coordinate. So we got two coordinates, alpha and beta. These are the two basically derivative, first order derivative. In Newton's law, also we had got first order derivative and a second order derivative, right? So we can say that geodesic equation in general relativity, what it describes, how particles move in curved space time. The Christoffel symbols capture the curvature of space-time and the equation ensures that the particle follows a path of least action in this curved space-time. Again, it follows the least path action. And you all know how do we define and measure the least path, this path action. Now, let us see the most important slide of today's class. Okay. Pay attention. The first one, d square x mu, right? This one. And d square x, what it is, similarity? First is that the d, d square x mu, right on the top, left-hand side, it says the term represents second derivative of the coordinate x mu with respect to proper time s. See on the right-hand side, right-hand side corner. Symmetry relates uh, uh, with interchangeable. Yes, yes, absolutely, you're right. Absolutely, absolutely, Vishal, you're right interchangeable of time and space access rotation symmetry. I will come back to that, but I'm very happy you got the right point. Yes, you're right, Visha. So on the right hand side, it shows the process shows that the second derivative of the position function with respect to time. That means both of them are coming again a similarity of Newton's law. You got it d square x mu and d square x. This has got a similarity in terms of second differential, uh, second derivative in Newton's law. Now you see on the top right hand side, dx alpha, dx raised to the power alpha. This is the first derivative, first order derivative of the coordinate with respect to time. Now see at the bottom, dx. This is the first derivative of the position with respect to time. So that means it automatically reduces to f equals to ma. I mean to say acceleration can be defined as a second derivative and Rakesh uh, Vishal was telling that it leads to a parabola, absolutely right, to a kind of a, a, a particle movement. So can't we see that from this kind of a beautiful equation, you see we are again going back track to Newton's law, obviously under certain conditions, weak approximation. We say the when the forces are very weak. So the, what the equation tells is very central. That means if we have established our general relativity as a classical system, and now we have shown that how Newton's second law of motion, because in Newton's second law of motion, there is no mu because there are no extra dimensions, right? If we if he would have had extra dimension, he might have solved it ahead of Einstein, maybe. This is, it is absolutely genius. But in Einstein's geodesic equation, we get extra dimensions, so we have got mu. So that is also a second derivative. Here also we get a second derivative. There also we got a first derivative. Here also we got a first derivative. Only it is in terms of the dimension. And most importantly, you see we have a t square and we have got a ds. That means it is also in terms of the proper time. Can we uh, can we say space time as a metric act as a metric fluid? Yeah, again a very good point. We we can we can say it is a metric fluid, but problem is that. Sorry, problem is that the metric fluid, whatever the parameters it will have, uh, the general metric tensor won't have those parameters, right? We shall. I will explain to that. So we can say we can say it is analogous. 
or it is similar to that but uh, isomorphic to metric fluid but metric fluid if you talk in terms of fluid dynamics whatever the parameters they have won't be matching with the metric tensor of general relativity thank you for this wonderful intelligent question visha okay so you understood you got this point very clear how it reduces and here it is that the theory of gravity and newtonian gravity we can tell how things are related and how this applies so you just can have a quick look onto that and you will understand what i am trying to tell okay so from here what we see is this one okay before going to this okay yeah let us finish up this now here you see there is a question again you might be coming in your night that why this entire geodesic equation is set to zero not to 1 2 3 or something else for that we need to understand which we already know what is called the principle of least action and what does the principle of least action tells from the classical mechanics law that the equation of geodesic is set to zero why because that it describes the path of a particle that is moving freely without any external influence i repeat it is moving freely without external reference so here you see this yellow ball is falling down and it is taking a classical lagrangian path if it is taking a classical lagrangian path that means it is falling without any interference on the right hand side blue box pay attention i have written that the particle is not being pushed or pulled in any direction and is simply coasting along the curvature of space time this is important that means the particle is not being acted with any kind of an interference but the curvature is taking or it is moving it is coasting along the curvature of space time which is actually what we call it as gravity which we call it as gravity so here it becomes important that why we set to zero otherwise it is set to zero that means that there is no external influence which is acting that means it is taking the curvature moving in a straight line but hold on as i showed you that here we don't deal with lagrangian we deal with what is called a lagrangian density and i have already made a video see lagrangian density as a concept it is same for quantum field theory classical mechanics i mean it's not classical mechanics quantum field theory quantum mechanics and general relativity so i have got a video uh, why we study lagrangian density in quantum field theory you can go ahead and watch it okay so what i am trying to tell is that we are taking now a density now why i am taking your density I wanted to give you a very kind of a very intuitive understanding so why we are talking of density and not a particular lagrangian so what happens is that in case of a flat space time when you are taking a particular uh, i would say a particular lagrangian say for example s equals to the integral of l and so on anyway so if i am taking a lagrangian then what it happens is that it follows a particular trajectory was rakesh was telling it strikes a parabola or whatever so here we define we can find out the history of each and every point each and every point we can find out a history in case of classical lagrangian i mean to say for example this l the classical lagrangian right but what happens as we will see maybe this is a little bit fuzzy but when when we taking a kind of a curve this kind of a weird space time it is very difficult to point and find out each and every point because the mathematics becomes too difficult and the, as the curvature changes things also change in this way so what we are trying to find out is a approximately the density of a particular area so we replace this l with a kind of a curvy l like this and that is why it is called a density we are taking a kind of a density those who know quantum mechanics also or quantum field theory you will see that when we move from field equation uh, you know field physics into something which is much more stretched out that is what is called taking a density that means we are we are trying to take over the density of that particular sphere or particular area and not taking the particle because otherwise here we cannot find out the position of each and every particle because space time is getting curved so we need to find the density so l moves to l uh, a kind of a curvy l which is called the lagrangian density now let me show you this equation so from lagrangian we move to lagrangian density you see here i have explained this uh, very clearly and easily so what happens in classical mechanics lagrangian is a function of generalized coordinates qi means q1 q2 q3 q4 but the moment we start dealing with quantum field theory or say for example general relativity when we are dealing with fields as i told you you see here the difference is this that this is a field 
Okay, let me draw it better. So you see, this this is a kind of a field. I mean to say, an area where these things are happening. It is a kind of a field. But here we deal with only particular particles. This one, this one, this one, this one, and we're trying to get the history of the particle. But the moment we start dealing with field, it becomes very important, difficult. And we try to get the partial derivatives with a particular 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 variable. It can be mu, it can be x, z, whatever. Is it also a probability density? No, 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 no. <laughs> it is not a probability density, Visha. Probability density will again come when we are dealing with quantum mechanics. Because try to understand, Vishal, probability comes in terms of when we are not very sure. This is an absolutely deterministic classical mechanics. But what happens is that the space-time itself, the sphere, etc., are bending and curving in such a way that we cannot find out the particular, uh, what you call, the history of the entire particle. Probability density will come. I will show you probability density will come when we are trying to show a particular electron and it's taking a bell-shaped curve. So this area would have the probability density, something like that. So here what we are trying to do is that we are trying to uh, find out the probability, uh, the Lagrangian density of that particular area. So here you see we get something which is the uh, curvy L followed by phi x, right? And followed by the partial of mu phi x, etc. So phi x will be a field and it will be, and this will be space-time derivative. So why we are moving? Because this is the density function. I think that answers Vishal's question better. So Lagrangian density is basically what we call it is in, in terms, it is a density function. Okay, how much dense a particular area? We will see that if you see my metric tensor video, I've shown that those curved linear paths are actually providing a, how much dense space time is in a particular area. I know it's a little bit counterintuitive. So that density is basically measured by Lagrangian density. That means the space and time, how much dense in somewhere it is and somewhere it is very loose. You can go to my metric tensor video, etc. Okay, now we come to the last part, which is the lower indices of Christoffel symbols are symmetric. Okay, let me go back to my whiteboard and uh, just to tell you uh, something which uh, I just intended to show you. Uh, where is that? Yeah, here it is. So here you see uh, what I find over here is these two indices. Uh, these two indices are, um, uh, you know, uh, symmetric. That means this part, this part. If you swap the indices, the value of the Christopher symbols remains the same. It is because, see, this is not only true to Christopher symbol. The entire genre of uh, general relativity, you will have a lot of uh, symmetries, symmetric areas. You have a lot of symmetric areas. And I, you will see that stress energy tensor, metric tensor, etc. All those have got symmetry. And what does those symmetry means as Vishal has put that interchangeable of time and space and many other things. So this part of the equation actually shows uh, that if you swap the indices, the value of the Christopher symbol remains the same. But however, there are further more values. Let me show you. Now, this is something very, very central. Christoffel symbols are uh, symmetric means the path that I am taking in terms of uh, parallel transport of vectors path is independent. What does that mean? I will show you a fresh uh, slide and things will uh, become much clearer because this is something. But I hope you all know what is a parallel transport. You see this person standing right on the globe is trying to take a spear and wants to move as straight as possible, as straight as possible. But when this person comes back to this red dot, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the vector is different, showing a different path. That means there is a curvature. This one and this one is not the same. And it is what Riemann curvature tensor actually measures. But anyway, so I tried to parallelly transport, but I cannot. Okay, so let me show you uh, uh, what do I mean by this. This might be a very pertinent uh, question uh, to your mind. So when I am taking, say, for example, uh, let me take this one. So if I'm taking a kind of an equilateral triangle or something like that, okay, and when I'm taking a sphere, I'm trying to move here and here, I'm trying to move. So what I will do when I come back over here, this will point here. That means it is zero. That means there is no curvature. But the moment I have taken this path, sorry, it's a horrible drawing. <laughs> so if I take this kind of a 
sphere or something like this. And I'm trying to move the sphere over in this path. And when I'm coming back, after moving, I'm coming back over here, I see my sphere is pointing towards this. Obviously, it means a curvature where I started and where I ended are different. But you might ask a question, instead of going in this way, why don't we go in this way? Definitely, I can go in this way. Instead of this, I'm going in this way. That is what it tells. You see now this part. That the covert parallel transport is basically, I have defined what is a way of transporting. And it tells that the parallel transports of vector is a path independent, which means that the path taken by, uh, by, the, parallel, by the vector does not affect the result. This is very important. Right? So the whatever the way I move, this way or that way, I will come back and it will show a curvature because the starting point and the ending point of the vectors are two different things. So Christoffel symbols are symmetric. That means these one, these two. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. This this one. Where it is? I didn't miss that. I need to have a pen. I need to help you someone to get a good brand for a, a pen, digital pen. Can Vishal or anybody later come in contact with me and just tell me which pen tab would be good because I'm not aware about these things, how to uh, install, etc. If you can please help me out. I need your help because I don't know all these things. Your young people might help me. So what I'm trying is that if I swam those indices also, this would be the same. So again, for you, this one is equal for the reason that if I parallel transport it in either direction, clockwise or anti-clockwise, it is the same. Another important thing is this one. This is a little bit uh, technical, but I will later explain it. The Riemann curvature tensor is also symmetric. The Riemann curvature tensor is also symmetric. Now, what do I mean by that? That means that the, the symmetry property of the Christopher symbol implies the Riemann curvature is symmetric. Now, what does that Riemann curvature tries to explain? I will explain it later. It will require another class to do so. But as you can see over here, what is happening? See, Ruv is equals to minus Rvu. The Bianchi identity, identity, the interchange semi symmetry, all of these are actually same. Now, you might ask, what does this signify? Or obviously, there are uh, sir, the other way of seeing parallel transport in vector is mm, the angle between the vector and the path along the pattern is, uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Very good point, Rocky. No, I am actually, uh, yeah, Rocky is absolutely, I must say Rakesh, sorry. Rakesh is absolutely correct. But the only thing is that Rakesh, we technically cannot call it an angle because in a curved space, we do, really don't have an angle, right? So you are very right that it can be told as the angle between the vector and the path along the path is feed through the transported closed path. Yeah. In a differentiable manifold, actually, we don't have an angle. So technically, as a teacher, I cannot tell you as an angle. But it is a very good point. So see, these are the intuitive things which Rakesh is telling. And this is also another way of learning. So Bianchi identity interchange, there are a lot of implications to that. I'm not going. But the Riemann curvature tensor also is symmetric. So Christopher symbols, this is. Another is Levi Civita connection, which for the timing you can just ignore. But what you can see on the right hand side, it says it implies that the geodesic equation, which describes the motion of particles in curved space time, is symmetric in its velocity indices. That means that the path of a particle taken in curved space time is independent of the order here or there or here or there, whichever way it travels. That means that is why this is symmetric. You see this. That means from here, if I am trying to move, where is the slide? Uh, sorry. So if I'm trying to move in either direction, here or here, it will be the same. So whatever the way the particle is moving, this mu nu or is equal to nu mu or something like that. This one. Uh, where is that? Yeah, this one. So whatever the path that particle is taking, whatever the path that it is moving, this would be always the same. So this is very important. And you see covariant derivative, the symmetry property implies computations involving covariant derivative and tensor calculus in curved spaces. It ensures that the results of differentiation are consistent. This is important. The results of differentiation are consistent and does not depend on the order in which derivatives are taken as a result we find that the mathematics is much more easier. So if I go back now to summarize this part, the lower indices of the crystal. So you first understood what is a Christopher symbol, how it defines the, uh, what you call the uh, 
uh, uh, the the, the uh, sorry, uh, what do you call this uh, geodesic equation. From there, we understood that the geodesic equation follows the principle of least action. Not only it follows the principle of least action, it also follows what is called a Lagrangian density. And uh, as Vishal and Rakesh and others have been pointed out, why we are taking a Lagrangian density? Because we need to find where the space time is very dense and where it is very loose. Also from here, uh, one thing important emerges is what? That the particle uh, is set to zero. This is set to zero because it will follow a natural path. That means there are no external forces acting on it. The particle is neither being pulled nor being pushed. And that is why it is coasting along the space time. That is the curvature. So we understood why it is set to zero because of the principle of least action. And the principle of least action is, is not the usual classical mechanics Lagrangian. It is Lagrangian density. We need to find out where the space time is. So when we move from Lagrangian to density, why? Because from particles, we are moving to fields. For each particle, it is easy to find the Lagrangian, uh, I mean to say the entire particle history. In quantum mechanics also, we can follow the Feynman path integral. But in case of quantum field theory, when we are moving from field to part, uh, from particle to field, we find it is all very messy. So we need to, okay, I will, next class, I will show you what this phi x and the partial derivative actually relates. It's very simple. Uh, it is already 56 minutes uh, over. Uh, it's almost dinner time, I think. So, and we also find out that the lower indices are uh, sy symmetric. It carries their importance. That means either this or that parallel transport remains the same. We also found out the Riemann curvature tensor is symmetric. Don't ask me why. It will take another 20 minutes to answer. And we have also find out this levi civita connection. I will explain later. A, it is an affine connection which defines and it implies that whatever way the geodesics moves, it is absolutely free and same. And the covariant derivative and the mathematics and the way we actually calculate that uh, uh, those are much more easier. So thanks a lot, sir. <laughs> So just to conclude, don't leave because I've been talking for a long time, right? I just came up from a college, had a little bit of coffee. And what did I have? Yeah, I had a little bit of coffee and biscuit and then I sat. Um, so well, what I'm trying to tell is that this is basically the uh, essence of Newton's law of motion. I will tell you very frankly, to be very honest with you, my eyes were full of tears in joy. The moment when I closed my eyes, it was around 3.30 in the night, at the night, and I was finding that it is just beautiful, uh, you know. Okay, I need to share my knowledge uh, for viewers. The rate of change of separation vector between two DO6 is equal to the Riemann curvature tensor, which is basically the acceleration due to gravity. Yes, absolutely. Technically, what Rakesh is telling is absolutely right. So I also need to tell you something, Rakesh, that at around 3.34 o'clock at night, when I'm just going down, to sleep, I see that it is as beautiful as the blossoming of a rose or the smile of a little child. So beautiful it is that how Newton's equation you see come and merges into ocean. That is generativity. And generativity, we appreciate your hard work, sir. Yeah, thank you. And from generativity now, you see how things under low uh, field approximation, it is again emerging to Newton. So never ever feel that Newton and generated that the foolish people who says that Newton was right, wrong, general derivative is right, this, that. No, everything actually emerges into some other thing. So uh, the basic thing is that you now see my daughter is peeping and it is already dinner time. <laughs> so you understand. So this is today's lecture. I think it is quite fruitful. There are a lot of people who came in. Generally, people try to avoid me. I don't know what is the reason. So we, we established today how Newton's law of equations, etc., Good evening, Professor. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I forgot your name, Satyam Nigam, right? If I remember correctly, cyber hashtag, Satyam Nigam. But you joined a lot late. Anyway, you can watch the recorded part also. Uh, uh, ah, well, that is a mystery. I, I keep on traveling, so I will let you know. So not an issue. So, uh, so we learned this. Now, in the next lesson, which I will try to make it on Wednesday, Tomorrow, I have to go coming up with an important class where I will try to discuss something about books on quantum mechanics, which book to read. I will try to make it. It's already 10 o'clock. I uh, don't know. I meant to make the slides ready. So this actually is something beautiful. We understood generative as the classical system. We now see that from... I missed your post, cat. Yeah, you can just uh, watch it late. And from there, how we it emerged into Newton's law. So either way, these are working. And we also found that Lagrangian won't work. It would go into Lagrangian density. And why it is set to zero? Beautiful, because it follows the least path action. 
So every and single part of geodesic equation, I made it clear. Generally, what you see in textbooks or master MSc or MSc, I would say geodesics much come later. But actually, geodesics should be. Uh, we want to thank you in person. Fine, Vishal, welcome. Okay, Vishal, just to tell you one thing more is that on 25th this Saturday, I'm coming up with a free webinar as usual on Einstein general relativity, and on 26th, Dr. Debanjan Bose is coming to talk on high energy physics uh, podcast on my channel. So that's it. Uh, there are five people who are watching right now. I don't know when this five will be 50 and 500. It is all for cyber hashtag Rakesh Vishal Pandey to take this responsibility. Spread the news that here is somebody who is taking absolutely free classes, hours or after hours on general relativity and other areas. So more people watch, more people come in. I feel happy. And the knowledge of science spreads. It actually creates, a, you know, there was a Nobel Prize winner. I don't remember her name, say 70, 72 years. He told that if you want to do science, don't do it for money, becoming a star, putting up your CV. It will only do for the benefit of mankind. At the end of the career, you will feel good. I wake up at 5.30 in the morning. I went to college and I came back by 7.15 today. See, for about one hour, I'm constantly talking because I want all of you to learn, learn, and learn so that the society is benefited by the science. I also make a mistake. I am also learning. So please share this podcast, share this news so that more people learn. I want to give the responsibility to Rakesh, Vishal Pandey, Cyber Hashtag, and others to make this 5 to 550 and 500 by next year. I don't know. I alone cannot do it because I also have my college lectures, webinars coming up in Vietnam, a lot of things. I would say very hectic but still i will try to do my best thank you very much i think this podcast uh, sorry this live telecast of generativity is beautiful it is as beautiful as a rose as beautiful as a smile of a little uh, uh, little girl little girl your mission is divine thank you vishal uh, you uh, your best wishes i think will make things happen a lot of hard work is involved a lot of uh, thinking is involved it goes on and goes on and rakesh is telling we will do it sir that means Rakesh is going to make this 5 to 50. Thank you very much. We'll see you uh, most probably tomorrow, if not day after tomorrow. Keep an eye on the community tag so that I can keep on posting what are the updates which are coming. 25th, 8 o'clock, uh, I am meeting with some people from Germany, etc. Try to deliver a very good uh, webinar on general relativity. I think Rakesh, etc. are all veterans. You have already <laughs> attended. And 26th, again, will be Devanjan Bose. And this week, I will try to finish up as much as I can with generativity and some good, uh, you know, live sessions where I can clear doubts on books of quantum mechanics. Thank you very much. Stay well. Goodbye.